Ah, okay, so welcome and um, I would like to talk about how to tame the Internet of Things and especially since we, this is a fourth conference, what uh, the role of force will be in the Internet of Things or can be, uh, this really depends on us. Um, so let's see. Uh, that I can go to the next slide. Ah, here we go. So what uh, I'm going to talk about is, of course, my view of what the Internet of Things is, and then uh, uh, we will look at the MQTT protocol just to give you a rough idea what's going on. And um, fourth role in the Internet of Things, of course, is that we want to have fourth things. So nodes in the Internet of Things will be programmed in fourth and um, how we could do this, we will discuss. And um, then uh, uh, once we have that understanding, I will go and give you a short demo. Um, there's lots of more things to uh, be explored. And maybe tonight we will have a workshop on uh, uh, other things uh, we, we will see. And um, yeah. This is a setup that is fine, but it opens a lot of questions. Um, what kind of messages will we exchange between the four things and the rest of the Internet of Things? So we will do a short discussion on this. And um, many things I raised are open questions. And um, the next topic is uh, that um, fourth is said to be great for creating domain-specific languages. And I also want to question how we would do this and uh, uh, what would be things to consider in that area. And then we come to a conclusion. So that's uh, my plan for the 40 minutes ahead. And let's see uh, how we do time-wise. And so what is the Internet of Things? Um, I believe it's mainly embedded systems uh, in many flavors that are interconnected uh, by using internet technologies. Very much like a local area network is no longer novel network, but it is uh, a local network using internet technology. And uh, so that's uh, here a very similar situation, I guess, um, that uh, we have these uh, things uh, which are embedded systems or com combination of embedded systems, maybe larger computers, and they communicate by using internet technology. And it turns out that in the Internet of Things, there are specialized communication protocols and, of course, security considerations like in the clients and servers that we have when we use the internet every day. Uh, so encryption and security and uh, uh, emergency response teams and all, all these questions come with uh, using internet technology. And Specialized communication protocols, and one of the, these kinds of protocols is the message queuing telemetry transport, short MQTT, which is a very popular protocol that uses a broker and it uses a publish and subscribe uh, 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 policy uh, so that things on the internet or things can communicate. There are many other protocols like 0MQ or MQP or DDS that also try to avoid using a broker. Uh, and uh, in some slightly different area, there is the robot operating system, which is not mainly used for internet communication, but uh, for connecting the different parts of a robot in mostly in scientific environments. And it has a very similar architecture. It has uh, published and subscribe um, mechanism and ROS just went from ROS1 to ROS2 and they started to get rid of the broker. So that might be something that we see with MQTT as well, but then you have to have some kind of discovery protocols so that the different things can find each other uh, for communication. So today we want to focus on MQTT um, communication via a broker, and we will have a shorter look on uh, what MQTT is so that you get a good understanding of um, what it is. So it's lightweight IoT communication. The idea is uh, 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 that you have a publish and subscribe policy, as I said, so it's um, mostly a one-to-end communication. One party communicates a message and other Many others uh, might be interested in that messages, uh, that kind of messages, and uh, 
receive the message when uh, uh, some publisher uh, publish a message. Yeah? And uh, we have a broker, a central server that deals with uh, the management of who gets what message and so on. Usually MQTT is, um, uh, uses uh, uh, TCP IP as transport protocol, but in principle, you can uh, use any other connection oriented protocol. Uh, and of course, because of this, you can tunnel it uh, in many various ways. Mm, but the typical one is you just uh, use a uh, TCP port and you communicate with that. How do you communicate? Um, MQTT has something that is called topics, and you can think of a communication channel. And uh, these um, uh, uh, communication channels, these topics, they have hierarchical names, uh, such as, let's see, the mouse works, device system interpreter input. And because it's a hierarchy, uh, you have uh, prefixes and you have more detailed um, um, channel names like uh, we have in URLs and th many things that you can do with URLs, you can also do with the topic names. Um, especially you can have something like wildcards, you can match only sub trees of uh, uh, that hierarchy and things like this um, uh, using wildcard name uh, symbols in these hierarchical names. So it's not just that you have a single channel uh, that you would submit to or uh, that you would subscribe, but you can also do this with um, uh, yeah, a subtree and then uh, uh, be very distinctive in uh, what you subscribe. So a node, uh, a thing in the Internet of Thing can uh, publish a message to a topic and all the subscribers of that to topic will receive the message. It will go to the broker and the broker then does all the distribution. Um, but um, um, yeah, that's just the way MQTT works. Um, in principle, what we will do with FOSS uh, later on, um, we not necessarily need this. All we need is you publish something to a channel and magically it appears uh, at the subscribers and uh, you can uh, work on that. So that's the what I would say core of MQTT. It has a lot of different other things like you can uh, attach a quality of service uh, notion to the messages. Uh, they could be persistent. You can describe something as a last will. So if your node uh, crashes or uh, is disconnected, uh, then the broker will take care that some final messages are spread to the subscribers so they can react on that. So many, many different things. Uh, that we can all use with FOSS uh, once we can communicate uh, MQTT, uh, of course, um, but we will not focus on that um, during my talk here. So um, MQTT is interesting because it has a wide support for libraries, application, community, uh, many people that deal with this, many home, smart home systems just use it. And uh, just to name a few, very exciting projects that uh, you can use is uh, the IBM system Node-RED, which allow you to graphically design flow, um, data flow and control flow architectures, and it can very naturally communicate uh, MQTT messages. So that's really a no-brainer, very nice system. And um, that's uh, um, IBM sells it as uh, wiring up the Internet of Things. So, and uh, with the ideas that I will present, we can play uh, part of that and um, leverage what others did. So that's nice. There's the MQTT Explorer, an open source uh, uh, viewer for MQTT messages, um, we, which we will see in action later. And uh, then there are different kinds of brokers. Uh, um, for example, Eclipse Mosquito is a very lightweight um, uh, MQTT broker that we will also see in action, but it runs in the background, so we won't see any, much of it. And lots of things. So there's a complete ecosystem around MQTT, and um, uh, that's nice because um, once we can uh, uh, connect to MQTT, then uh, we can interact with these kinds of systems. So, um, which means uh, in MQTT, in principle, we have publishers and subscribers like we have servers and clients in the normal internet. Um, we have MQTT publishers that publish something to a, a topic 
And uh, uh, because it's an embedded system, it's uh, you, uh, reading some sensors, it works on some actors or whatever. And uh, then on the other hand, we have subscribers that are interested in the messages that are sent on that topic and um, uh, can uh, record this uh, and act on the appropriate messages. And of course, a single thing can be both a publisher and subscriber at the same time, the same way as a laptop computer can also be some kind of server uh, to some other devices. So, um, which means um, a more complete uh, picture of this is you have a thing and it subscribes to some channels and uh, it might get commands from that uh, channel and it will uh, act on them. It will read sensors and uh, it might uh, publish maybe sensor readings or uh, prepared sensor readings or whatever uh, you want. And um, then in addition, you might have something like a viewer that is just used for uh, observing what this uh, system does. It also connects to some channel and um, some other channel for subscri uh, subscribes and publish to something else. And like uh, you have RX and TX uh, exchanged if you uh, want to do a serial line uh, connection, um, a null modem uh, here, you publish on one channel that the other things might subscribe and vice versa. And uh, down there we see a typo that is probably appearing quite often because the line has been copied and pasted on the slides. Well, anyway, um, so um, how do we deal with force then? Well, we want to have force things. Yeah? And then uh, once they are able to, uh, able to communicate via MQTT, they just plug in as things in the Internet of Things, and uh, that's great. We know how to uh, deal with sensors and actors. Um, so the inner core here, the force system with sensors and actors, that's what we do over the last 40 years, uh, um, and we are quite good at that. And uh, so what we need here is something that um, allows us to uh, connect to uh, MQTT slash the Internet of Things. MQTT is just a, um, an example here. If we use any of the others, Internet of Things protocols, then uh, what I explain here will essentially be the same. So, and what do we do? Uh, four systems have input, the terminal input buffer or uh, mass storage input, uh, where we store source code or we, where we give commands in uh, in the outer interpreter and it has output. We have dot and emit and type and, and that outputs things. And uh, the idea is um, to have a wrapper around our force system that um, subscribes to a channel, uh, maybe the input channel, yeah, yeah like this, and uh, feeds this into the input of our force system and um, then captures the output uh, of our force system and publishes on the output channel, output topic. Yeah. Right, and so then we have a force system that can be reached by sending messages um, uh, on the Internet of Things using the MQTT protocol. Yeah. So we connect force input and output to topics. That's the idea. And let's see uh, how can we do that. There are different uh, ways to do it. <clears throat> of course, you can just have some host system and you connect to your um, fourth uh, using serial input and output and you have a wrapper uh, that can uh, talk MQTT. Then your fourth system doesn't need to know anything about MQTT. It just uh, does serial input and output as normal uh, fourth embedded systems do or you have it on a host and uh, then you, you stand it in and stand it out or what have you. Um, or you uh, have a wrapper that uh, connects uh, not via serial line, but maybe wireless or via Ethernet to your embedded system. So an industrial uh, setup, maybe that's uh, the way that you have. You have some central MQTT uh, communicator somewhere in your uh, installation and then you access um, the uh, for system, how you did it all the time. Yeah. Or you have um, a system that uh, uh, can leverage uh, an MQTT library, for example, and can talk MQTT on its own. Yeah. So, and then uh, 
uh, you could um, uh, do all these uh, publish and subscribe via some internet means. So that's uh, always the case. Publish and subscribe is internet connections. So they don't need to be co-located. They can be anywhere. Yeah. So that's um, uh, the nice thing about that. So these are different kinds of uh, flavors, how you could um, uh, have a system like that. So if you can easily um, leverage uh, third party MQTT libraries, then it's uh, reasonable to just have MQTT in your force and uh, uh, deal with that uh, in, in, in that area or uh, even a fourth implementation of the MQTT protocol with the underlying TCP IP stack uh, would be possible, um, but uh, it's not necessary to do so. We can just wrap around and then uh, go ahead. And of course, we can also uh, do interactive development with a system that is set up like uh, I just described. Um, we could have maybe the whole on hierarchical source code management system to do interactive development. Um, if in the whole on environment you do an incremental change, then you can just press um, the load button on the unit. It will um, write down uh, the uh, appropriate change to some uh, communication file, and there might be a monitor that um, uh, detects a change and publish it on the input channel of our system, essentially um, giving a command to update the running program. So um, I won't go into detail here, but I can give a demonstration um, uh, afterwards or tonight, uh, whatever you think is appropriate. So, um, the, and now we're ready for the demonstration and let's see what we have. Um, I already started the MQTT broker that is running. And what I want to do is I want to start the MQTT Explorer um, that will connect to the broker uh, so we can see messages that are communicated. And then we start seed force in a way that uh, its input um, comes from uh, reading the uh, topic device system seed force input and its output goes to a device system seed force output. Yeah? And um, we can use the MQTT Explorer to send messages and to see what's going on. And we can also have a command line client that uh, connects uh, to Seedforce channels in the twisted way. So it outputs to the input channel and it uh, uh, reads and displays on the screen from the output channel so that we can uh, use uh, this um, to interact with uh, Seedforce. So let's see how we do that. Uh, we're going to the terminal, that's fine. And I'm starting the MQTT. Uh, maybe I already have this. Let's see. Um, yeah, there it is, the MQTT uh, Explorer. I connect uh, to the uh, broker that is on my laptop here. So in the setup, in this demo, all is on the same machine but that uh, does not necessarily be uh, like that. It could be any remote system uh, uh, to connect and uh, uh, broker, explorer, and uh, seed force and the command line all could be on different, uh, on different machines. So let's say we do it like this maybe, and uh, let me arrange this a little bit. Right, and um, I talked about the wrapper around the system and my wrapper is called host. Um, it captures the uh, output of Seedforce and prepares uh, appropriate MQTT messages. And uh, whenever I type something in, uh, uh, oh, no, uh, and whenever something is uh, actually uh, uh, submitted on the input channel, it will feed it into a Seedforce. So with See, Seedforce is starting and we can just use it normally here um, and do some calculations maybe and uh, do things. And oh, ho, what we've seen in the Explorer, there has been a message that uh, has been transmitted. So that's a uh, nice thing. Uh, oh, uh, output, um, let, me, let me arrange this window a little bit and you see strange things here and you probably know what's going on. 10, 20 plus 30, okay, that's fine. And um, then there is other strange things. Aha, color and emojis and things like this. 
So that's pleasant for us. And I really like having colors and the smileys in my, uh, in my seed force. And um, uh, because it gives me a good feeling when programming it. But it's actually not so nice uh, if uh, we uh, have this uh, uh, in, in the message output uh, in the Internet of Things. So, and that's one thing I uh, saw that we really need for a long time uh, is be able to control the output of force system uh, in, a, in a more uh, precise way. So what we can do in the Explorer is uh, we can go here and see the history of the messages that this uh, system has sent. So welcome to Seedforce. Ah, yeah, we see this uh, and so on. Uh, uh, so that's uh, that's rather nice. And uh, yeah, um, so the MQTT Explorer it suddenly captures all the output that our system has. So the control characters are not nice. And so I propose to have a word quiet. Yep, and quiet says, don't echo anything anymore. Yeah, uh, but just output the things that, uh, that we have. Oh, no messages are sent. So that's strange. Somehow we need to say, uh, when is the end of the message reached? And the idea is, well, if the system outputs a new line, uh, but currently it doesn't output a new line. If I see 10, 20 plus dot, it outputs 30 and no new line. So uh, we have to uh, change the output of the system in a way that it just outputs new line at the places where we normally have okay, but otherwise doesn't echo uh, characters that are input and doesn't do any fancy escape sequence stuff uh, to do things yeah and uh, so nice and uh, let's see what we have and if i do 10 20 plus dot again it outputs 30 and um, uh, also um, sends the appropriate message that we can see here and there's some magic of um, the uh, mqtt explorer that if the uh, messages on the channel are numbers, it tries to uh, do, uh, draw a chart automatically. So that's probably not, nothing that we want to do. Uh, oops, that's probably bad. Uh, let's see. Hello, Euro fourth. Yeah, so yeah, we do this and it sends the, the appropriate messages. Okay, so that's nice. Um, if we type in something in the force system, uh, then the output is now uh, appropriate messages that some other Internet of Things thing uh, that is subscribed to that channel can read and deal with. So nice. Um, so let's look down here. What can we do else? Uh, what else can we do? Uh, there is a published panel. Uh, we don't want to publish on the output. We want to publish on the Seedforce input channel. Yeah, and uh, then uh, I can say something like um, uh, like words maybe. Yeah. Aha, great. So words, and uh, here we still have uh, escape sequences output. But you see, I can send commands here, or I can do colon definitions. Uh, Test ten zero do uh, do i dot not comma dot loop semicolon well, semicolon publish uh huh great uh, nothing happens but now I can uh, run test uh, here we go um, and uh, the output is just the sequence of uh, uh, of numbers and the history is still there, so we can scroll back. Uh, no, no, not yet. But anyway, um, so uh, yeah, the output of force system shows up as MQTT messages, and the input um, uh, is read from the input uh, topic, so we can uh, interact with this. Um, so now the system is no longer pleasant to use. Um, if I'm typing in something here, it will not show up. Um, so what we need uh, is maybe a command line access to, uh, 
to a system. And we saw uh, what this could be. It's this twisted um, uh, channel uh, system that we want. And uh, so let me see if I'm doing this. Um, I have the control of big blue button here still on, on there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and you, you have it in Twitch as well. So um, if I connect to this channel, it knows about the broker and all these things. And it says, okay, yeah, I connected to that channel. And um, uh, the things that I'm typing in this connection program will now go to the input channel. And what is written to the output channel is just shown uh, on the screen here. And now I can do the same. I can run test here. And uh, I have a more or less uh, false feeling uh, doing things here um, and uh, can interact with the system. And as you see, uh, the MQTT Explorer uh, captures all what's going on, uh, the things that I input and also the output. Uh, so this is a good protocol facility uh, that uh, just goes there. And of course, um, in a more elaborate setup, uh, we would connect um, ESP32 uh, um, uh, embedded system uh, with some hardware uh, attached to it um, and um, then uh, let it uh, talk to uh, MQTT channels and we can remote control uh, that system. Uh, and um, uh, ESP32 can do Wi-Fi connections, so it's easy for, for it to connect to the internet. Uh, of things um, so uh, and do uh, there are MQTT libraries so ESP32 systems can just uh, be easily extended to do the MQTT stuff. Uh, I did the wrapper thing but um, uh, we can look at it in the workshop uh, tonight but uh, that's mainly it. So that's my um, my present uh, my demo and uh, so we saw this I think we saw everything that is interesting uh, what I wanted to show to you. Right, so um, what we saw is that we, when we connect force input and output to topics, we can uh, talk force on the topics. So we can send uh, um, commands there, we get results, and uh, we learned that it's interesting to control the output of the force system. So uh, I uh, have two words, verbose, and we can do in the demo, yeah, I can say, okay, do verbose. And then all the escape sequences are back again, and I can use it here in this uh, window just normally. And you see all the MQTT messages that are uh, uh, sent uh, and published uh, in the other window. So, and uh, no, this one, um, and quiet, uh, uh, calms down the system so that it only communicates the essential part, making up appropriate uh, MQTT messages. And uh, this is uh, quite handy, and I would really like to see that many systems uh, uh, provide quiet and verbose uh, so that uh, this can be done with uh, many other systems. On the other hand, it's nothing that I would intend to standardize. So, because it's system dependent easily to implement on most systems. So, uh, another issue um, uh, is uh, what kind of messages do we exchange? And uh, yeah, we connect force input uh, to the input channel and output to the output channel. Um, what do we do? And uh, to me, it looks like there are two different kinds of notions. Uh, uh, what we can do. Uh, of course, if we do a request, we send commands yeah, in some command language, be it force proper or be it um, some domain specific language in which we uh, think about a little bit uh, later on. Um, but what would the result be? So we have thing one that wants to uh, co communicate to thing two, our force system, it sends uh, some force source code like xget, for example, and then the question is, what would be the answer? Would it be just the value 42, and uh, then you interpret the data on the calling side, um, and then you have to have special encodings for errors and um, uh, overflows or whatever for special values um, to deal with this in uh, when interpreting, or uh, an alternative 
um, and this goes back to Heinz Schnitter's idea on the open network force, ONF. You send a command, but the answer that you get is also a sequence of commands, a program. And this needs to be evaluated on the calling side. So you say X get, and uh, the answer is 42 X store OK. Uh, and OK could mean everything's fine, please do that. And if you have an, an error, then uh, also ONF uh, submitted KO. And uh, the way that you program this on the um, calling side is that OK and KO could be deferred words. And you stick in the handler uh, of what you want to do in the success case into the OK handler and uh, uh, what you want to do in the failure case into the KO handler. And then you just evaluate your program. And if it's OK, then the OK handler will be invoked. And uh, if not, the KO handler will be invoked. And uh, that's it. Um, the, the above kind of communication um, is asymmetric. So one sends commands, and the other one sends values. And um, the uh, the communication uh, below is symmetric. One sends commands and the other one sends commands as well. And both will evaluate them, uh, of course, uh, the force system on the right-hand side will evaluate this uh, xget command sequence. And so, um, yeah, I didn't think this through, uh, but uh, it, I think it could be beneficial that um, it's really symmetric and the success of the open network force uh, from Heinz really shows that uh, that uh, uh, is probably quite a good and clever idea. So yeah, so these are different kinds of messages. As I said earlier, I'm raising more or less questions here. So uh, what kind of uh, communication uh, scheme is appropriate needs to be figured out. And the next one is domain specific language. Um, so in the demo, I just send for source code, and that's fine in a controlled environment. And the force philosophy is, of course, you know what you're doing, crash often. If you type something wrong or you did something wrong, let the system crash. Um, yeah, nice if you can push the reset button. But not so nice uh, if uh, the, the thing is uh, 100 miles away and you can't reset it. Um, so, uh, and maybe you're not in a controlled environment, uh, yeah, protected by encryption or whatever, or arbitrary user input is used as uh, commands uh, to the thing, then uh, you have to do some other things. And yeah. I always uh, or often hear force is very well suited for DSLs. And I wonder, yes, uh, that's probably right, but how? Yeah, and um, some ideas came into my mind um, that is sealed vocabularies. So you can restrict the amount of commands that would be accepted by a force system by uh, restricting uh, the, the dictionary. Uh, we will look into that uh, in a moment. Um, yeah, force uh, is tailored or is, is suitable for uh, uh, enabling a natural language syntax. And um, yeah, so the, the question is, is there any best practice uh, to design force DSLs? Uh, people do it ad hoc, I know, but um, is there some uh, something written down, do it in a structured systematic way? And uh, connected to this is also, um, what what about sandboxes? Can we uh, provide a command interface where you cannot crash the system uh, that uh, interprets um, the, uh, the commands. Like probably uh, you have to avoid memory corruption or inspecting arbitrary areas in memory and things like this. So let's talk about these uh, issues a little bit. And I have to look at the clock, uh, so some short minutes. Um, uh, will be sufficient. So sealed vocabularies, you put all your DSL uh, in uh, in a word list of, of its own. 
and then you uh, evaluate the program in just uh, this collection of uh, word lists uh, and so the normal false words might not be found unless you en enable them in, in these word lists. Yeah, um, that's a very old technique and uh, I came up uh, while playing around with this uh, word evaluate and search order where you give a string to be interpreted so it's like evaluate and um, uh, uh, then uh, uh, maybe I star X is uh, below that. And you give it a list of uh, word lists, identifiers, uh, and then it sets up order that way, evaluates, and then uh, regardless of what's happening, uh, uh, resets the order. So that's the idea. Um, and this might be helpful in playing around with these kinds of uh, protected DS DSLs. Um, the other idea that I had uh, or remembered from old times is how would you design your DSLs? And uh, I remembered a, um, a talk from uh, Will Baden about different kinds of false words. Uh, and he said, well, look at the stack effect. If you have nouns, then these are um, words that produce something on the stack. If you have verbs, then uh, they are words that get something from the stack and act on it. And maybe you have adjectives uh, that transform uh, the things on the stack. Yeah? And uh, uh, if you categorize the fourth words in these uh, three uh, categories, or maybe uh, additional ones, and um, uh, then you make your command phrases subject, object, object, verb, then uh, uh, this might be very uh, human readable, like uh, elbow 30 degrees clockwise turn. Um, and uh, you can read up uh, what uh, Will Baden uh, has done in some old fourth dimensions uh, uh, with a report on the 80, 84 Saloma conference. Interesting enough, um, the, the, re the review shows more detail on that thing than is actually in the proceedings. So good that um, someone listened carefully. Right, and uh, so uh, then about uh, sandboxes. Um, so how can we restrict uh, the command language that a, an internet of fourth thing or fourth internet of thing thing um, uh, will uh, uh, do uh, so that we cannot corrupt the, the system by issuing the commands? Um, and um, uh, is there a systematic approach to do that? Um, uh, yeah, and what, what do, we, do we need to do? So, um, yeah, so whoever has best practices on, do, uh, on creating DSLs uh, and says, okay, these are my rules to do it, uh, then please contact me. And if you have good idea of uh, how to do sandboxing, um, yeah, how we can restrict the commands, uh, of course, uh, if you provide fetch and store, uh, in the general case, that wouldn't work because then you could inspect memory and corrupt memory in arbitrary ways because you put, can put a number on the stack probably and then fetch uh, arbitrary memory locations. So if there's anyone who has experience with that, I would be interested as well. Good. This brings me to the conclusion. We talked about the general Internet of Things and my perception of this is it's connected embedded systems using internet technology. We talked about MQTT, a publish and subscribe protocol for the internet of things that communicates via a broker. There are other brokerless uh, communication protocols uh, that could be considered in the future. We talked about four things. And the idea here is connect the input of the force system and the output of the force system to MQTT topics for publish and subscribing. We see the demo, saw some live stuff uh, connecting uh, things in this way. And uh, then uh, we talked about the different kind of messages. Uh, do we want to have data responses or program responses? Uh, symmetric or asymmetric communication there or and then uh, we talked about domain specific languages uh, one way to do that in fourth is here vocabularies we talked about nouns and verbs and adjectives and sandboxes uh, and uh, yeah this is the conclusion and uh, so um, i'm open for question and uh, one minute ahead uh, so we have another five minutes for discussion and questions so Thank you very much for listening to my talk.
So, if you have any questions, please lift your hands. It has a lift your hand uh, on the um, right button if you want to use that. So, Andrew Reed, please. Thank you. Thank you for the talk, Ali. Mm -hmm. Sure. What 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 does this mean for the hardware? You mentioned that it will run well on an ESP32 because actually the libraries for the MTTQ are already available. Um, and you gave another example where the fourth system might not have that sophistication, but um, could be connected by um, RXTX to mm -hmm. some wrapper hardware, which also has internet and MTTQ. I realize this is new, but just what's what's your instinct? In the old days, you you could do fourth on a on a, on a PC that was you know a micro a microcomputer that was just just a, the simplest one that you could get out of the box. But but clearly, it seems the wrapper could actually be as complicated um, from a software point of view as the fourth and the, the applications running inside. So where do you think this settles out? What's our what's mm -hmm. our baseline? Is it is it an eight bit processor, a thirty two bit? What what does it mean for us? Yeah, and, and uh, pr probably I assume that uh, GCP IP stack and um, uh, uh, implementation of the MQTT protocol is probably too much for an 8 bit processor. 64K we had in the discussion uh, just before the talk. Uh, so that would probably be, not be uh, enough memory to implement this, which means the transition from what, however, the, uh, the, that force system would communicate. Um, uh, so the uh, Internet of Things needs to be done in the environment. And um, so I can think of a uh, um, uh, industrial facility where you have uh, the, the normal communication means that are maybe some uh, field bus uh, interface, CAN or, or Interbus or whatever, and um, then uh, the, the system needs to communicate that way. If you want to connect it to the Internet of Things, then you have to go to some of the Internet of Things protocol. Um, and th then the environment would do that. So if we're talking about larger systems, larger embedded systems, are we, in, in, in former years we talked about deeply embedded systems, the small one, uh, resource restricted things, and you probably wouldn't have Internet connection there. But uh, on today's embedded systems like uh, ARM or ESP32, um, you would just use a vendor supplied library uh, to do that. And yeah, maybe that's megabytes uh, as it is with the Bluetooth stack, for example. Um, and uh, the fourth within is just a couple of uh, 100 kilobytes, maybe, or a couple of kilobytes, depending on uh, the, the, the capability. Um, but um, yeah, th that's. I don't, don't think that's the question, uh, because uh, we want to do this command processing. Yeah, and uh, I believe it's much better than uh, exchanging uh, JSON messages and then have a JSON interpreter in the thing uh, that uh, um, extracts values and, oh, one way it looks like a command, mm, the other one, they look like arguments, and then I will combine something like a call. So I, I think that Fourth with its stack-based thing is, is much easier. And the nice thing is you can, like with the traditional internet protocols, you can connect to uh, a device and give commands there and uh, see how it reacts. It's like you turn it into a mail, cl a mail server and send uh, an email message uh, by explain, uh, experiencing uh, uh, the command line, yeah, which is a text protocol, SMTP, or you, you check your email by doing um, IMAP by hand. That's possible. And I uh, always thought this is really a great advantage uh, because it allows interactive debugging and uh, um, analyzing uh, of the system. Later on, if everything works fine, then the machine, let the machine talk. But if something goes wrong, we can go ahead and, and, and um, uh, investigate uh, as a human as well. And so I, I see both. Yeah, the small systems that don't have internet connection, the environment will provide it. The larger system, they will have internet connection on its own, and uh, you will use vendor libraries to do that. And maybe some of us will go ahead and say, yeah, 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 I want to do TCP/IP anyways, and I'm doing MQTT on top. 
then I'm happy to accept a force implementation for this as well, of course. So Thank we you. have another question by Gerald Rodney. Yeah, I just wanted to say I did something like this by connecting up uh, Redis with uh, McCrisp. So it was really a raw mm -hmm. system. And actually the chaining was not the problem. The issue was more with the input in general. But I think your MQTT approach is much more interesting than that because there's a bigger ecosystem as you've just shown us. So I would be mm -hmm. really interested in making a, a MQTT library or helping you create one mm -hmm. native mm -hmm. to force. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good approach. Yeah. And I just want and I just wanted mm -hmm. to mention because you said field buses, some field buses like BACnet, they even have a special virtual terminal which you can have on any devices. Mm -hmm. So to mm -hmm. end, you know, that, that way you can talk force and higher level object languages. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah, that would be interesting. Of course, maybe we can leverage what uh, TCP IP implementations are already there and uh, have a look at MQTT. I don't think it's too complicated to do that. Maybe with all the bells and whistles, last last wish and quality of service, uh, then uh, it's uh, more elaborate. But uh, uh, I think it's it's doable. Um, and um, yeah, that, that certainly would be a nice thing uh, to, to, to have this. And um, on the other hand, MQTT is just a, an example. Um, and I think uh, uh, force with interpreting source code and outputting data or source code, um, uh, that's something that we uh, in, in the community need to further elaborate. Uh, I open the questions uh, like sandboxing, how do we do domain specific languages and cookbooks in that area would be great uh, so that uh, uh, people can come and say, okay, uh, force is so great in domain specific languages, um, how do I do it? And then we can just say, okay, this is the best practice that we can come up with. So we have some more questions, but we have run out of time. So uh, Gerard, how tight is the schedule? It's not super tight. Let's do the questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the next one is uh, Stephen Peltz. I would I would just like to comment that at the lower end of what you're talking about, Uli, mm -hmm. um, you should not forget Daniela Perry's experience with Wi-Fi equipped networking, where he mm -hmm. actually does exactly what uh, Heinz Schnitter did um, mm -hmm. and sends forth messages backwards and forwards, um, mm -hmm. and his protocol is very well defined. Okay, great. Uh, um, second thing is that um, we MPE have been shipping TCP IP stacks for 20 plus years um, mm -hmm. and what also makes those useful and relevant is that with, a, with the sock puppet interface you can act actually talk to C libraries from the falls. Right. So mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of what, when you're talking about MQTT, um, that you know th there is no need to reinvent the wheel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. because they're all available as libraries. Yeah, yeah, yeah which is one approach that I uh, envisioned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next so, so question. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, next question, dear Kuhlmann, and please, um, uh, questions and answers short. Okay, um, short question then. Um, Uli, how would you summarize the value proposition of, of uh, your idea? Um, there uh, was this point Andrew was making, so fourth might be a small part of a uh, a software system that is actually huge in regard to proprietary libraries and so on, and will way, uh, go way beyond what a typical 8-bit processor would do. Um, so uh, is it the uh, easy extensibility in terms of DSL languages, or um, what exactly uh, is the, um, the, the core proposition there? Because it, it can't be the smallness, uh, because you come, it comes with so much other stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the interactive nature, I guess. And of course, we're competing uh, with uh, others there. Uh, I mean, a MicroPython-driven uh, 
uh, embedded system that does the same or has a REPL, a Python REPL. Uh, but if they expose this uh, on the Internet of Things, that's the question. So I uh, really see that uh, as the, the, the point that we can interactively uh, deal with the things. And um, uh, like we did in our typical fourth program development, explore things uh, and uh, debug things uh, in that way. And uh, that's that's a benefit. Of course, other systems can this, Python can this, Lua can do this, uh, Lisp can do this, but do they have the same amount of um, uh, um, embedded control uh, uh, capabilities that um, uh, that Forth provides? I don't know. And um, yeah, yeah. So these these could be alternative ways to do it. Uh, but since we are convinced that force is the right way to do it, 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 it I think that's the advantage. Uh, you can really connect to any device and uh, then operate on it. That's great. Anton, I think we have to move on. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry, Bernd. 